You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott Hambrick. That's Matt Reynolds. And we were starting to talk about some stuff. And Matt said, wait a minute, we need to record. I have no idea where this is going. Well, I was, I was just saying, I, I made a, it's springtime. I get it. I, here's the one thing I really kind of miss is travel. And the thing of, I, I'm drinking a michelada. That's simple base of the story. I made a homemade michelada. It reminds me of Mexico. It reminds me of your, your speedo with the little, with the, like the skull and crossbones mm-hmm. hanging down dangling next to your nether regions i miss it i miss you <laughs> i miss those, the speedo and i miss you and me hammering michelada's all week michelada's in mexico good. yeah i uh i like i was saying and i think this is what made you want to turn the mics on that i even like those budweiser ones that come in like the 40 ounce cans i do too i had i had one last week and i had a Modelo one which are all they're also good the Modelo ones and I, I don't know what they are either it's like well the Bud, get... the Budweiser one is clamato. So I think there's a little bit of difference because I think the Budweiser one has clamato juice. I prefer it, by the way. Me too, which is what I made this with was clamato juice. And the Modelo is a tomato juice base. I made this one hot, put some tahine in there and a bunch of Worcestershire. And some, some what? Uh, tahine, that's weird salt, that Mexican salt. I don't know. It's like orange and it's got a bunch that. of I don't know. I don't know what it is. And then what's that uh uh, Maggi. What's that sauce? So- what's that? What is it? Maggi. Maggi. Yeah, I did Maggi sauce and I did Worcestershire sauce because best of both worlds. Maggi sauce is a little more like a soy sauce than a than a Worcestershire. Yeah, Would it's you like agree? a yeah, it's like a fermented wheat instead of yes, soy. Instead of soy. By the yeah. way, I bought. I got on. A, I don't know if you ever do this. Uh, the other night, I was having a hard time sleeping, and I got on a little shopping kick, which I don't do very often. And I got on Amazon, and I bought the best soy sauce you can buy. Which is only 30 bucks a bottle and will last me, you know, 47 years because how often you go through a bottle of soy. I got tired. I'm tired of eating crappy soy sauce. Keep so I got real good soy and uh, I bought some real good miso too. Because, you know, mostly I was thinking to myself, I don't have enough estrogen in my life. So I need to, I need to get a little more. So, and then it's an international flair right now at the Reynolds household with micheladas and soy and miso and whatnot. You've said soy in this conversation way too many times. It's enough. We said it, and we said it in a positive light. That's what's crazy. It's the only time we've probably ever mentioned soy in a positive light. Soy. Oh my god! How much estrogen can actually be in a little soy sauce that you dip your sushi in? Not that much. Mm, probably not in the soy sauce. All right, let's answer some questions. The subject: Stop benching. See, it has a question, question mark. Stop yep. benching? Question Stop mark. Stop benching. Yeah, question mark. Like question mark. Okay. Uh, his name's Christer. Christer. C H R I S T E E R. Christer. Christer. I don't know. From Norway. I know. Says I have some issues with my left shoulder. I'm unable to keep the shoulder blade tucked while benching. It's fine with light weights, but as soon as it gets heavy, I struggle to complete the lift while keeping it tucked. I have to focus almost purely on keeping the shoulder blade tucked. A lot of tucking here to prevent it from untucking, <laughs> especially when I go over three to four re- uh, reps. He said he dislocated that shoulder about twenty years ago. He's thirty nine. Now is he? He's talking about. Is he talking about shoulder blade retraction? I think. Or is he no, talking about tucking the humerus like closer to your rib cage on the way down and on the way back up? I don't know which one he's talking about. I, since he, I don't know either, but I think that since he's talking about all the shoulder blade tucking. Okay. <laughs> then he's talking about shoulder blade retraction. So you and I have really never talked about tucking. Do you, are you a down tuck, an up tuck, or right tuck, or left tuck? Uh, 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 down into the middle. I'm down into the right. Down to the middle. Interesting. Oh, oh, I thought you were actually talking about benching. Chris here. <laughs> Chris here needs to try to hold a dime between his shoulder blades. Correct. As he's laying on the bench, he should probably also try to get his shoulder as close to his hip as he can while he's laying there on the bench. Get real tight. Yep. The CrossFit wieners call it packing your shoulder. Yeah, I don't like that either. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily like that. I think like that's that. actually originally a kettlebell term. But it... Uh, Pavel. It, it's a, I think pack the shoulder is an okay cue to use sometimes with some people. So, so, so maybe do that. And uh, I find that people that are moving from that kind of 250 to 300 pound bench press area start having trouble doing this 
Yeah. Because it's so much more effortful that they kind of let go of all that, uh, their back, um, in an effort to lock out those heavies. And I, I don't know. I ain't no doctor. I can't even see you. Sure. You didn't even send a picture. We're not sure even what you're talking about necessarily, <laughs> but, <laughs> but if I but assume you do a whole keep lot your of shoulders, things. that's right. And you do for people that are listening, which is everybody else other than this guy, is that you do want to keep your shoulder blades retracted during the bench press. You want to keep your shoulders as close to your hip as you can in an arch position, right? Yeah, shoulder blade retraction is when you try to get them to touch together behind you and it pulls your shoulders way, way back. Protraction would be when you tried to get your shoulders to touch together in front. That's the opposite. Yeah, which I think is actually abduction of the Ab- shoulder blade. Abduction, I was yeah. it's abduction. And so what a lot of people do is as they lock out the bench press, they abduct or protract the shoulder blades and kind of do this big stretch thing. Kind of like what the way we teach the press, that big shrug at the top of the press, which is good. You do not want to do that in the bench press. The shoulder blade sort of stays fixed in the in the bench press and in the press it's it moves through it more of a range of motion. It it it's moves around there on yeah, the press. Yeah, be careful when you lock out to not lock out so hard your shoulder comes off the bench. Keep those shoulders right. on there, keep the shoulder blades together. Here's some cues that may help. That's right. When you lower the bar, bend the bar in your hands. Yep. Cue number one. Here's another cue. As you lower the bar, pull your chest to the bar. Meet yep. the bar on the way down with your chest. Um, another one that can help sometimes squeezing the bar really hard can actually help with that. So that those cues will help you get it right on the way down. But we also have a problem when we go up, um, kind of overlocking out. And I tell yep. people just lock out the elbow, just the elbow, yep. only lock yep. your elbow. And those yep. things maybe will help. All good cues. He, Chris here says that it's been a bad lift and it feels like shit and stuff. I'm like, that's all the lifts. Like at some point, <laughs> that's all of them. Uh, Everything hurts. I, I, I think you're probably just getting a, a decently heavy bench there and having a problem that that everybody has when they get a decently heavy bench. That's yeah. what I think. Kevin says, transition to HLM? Hmm? I wanted to start off by saying I really appreciate the content you put out into the world. Um, well, thank you. He said, I just... Finished listening to episode 269, which deals with the four-day split. Um, He said, I realized partway through, as Matt was introducing the benefits of the four-day split, that I may have missed something with regards to HLM. Assuming that someone is transitioning to HLM from LP, this means heavy, light, medium, from linear progression, they would keep the 1.5 times frequency for the upper body lifts. My question is, how would one approach that? My impression is that there should be a press week and a bench week. So, um, well, it's the, it's the three-day-a-week problem, man. Yeah, that, and the only difference that you basically end up having, right, it is the three-day-a-week problem, and you are right that there is a week that you'll bench twice, and the next week you would press twice. And the difference is on the, on the two-times-a-week bench press or the two-times-a-week press, you would have a volume session and an intensity session. So one of those two would be volume, like a you know four sets of five, five sets of five, somewhere in that ballpark. And the other day would be the intensity day where you might work up to like a heavy triple and some back off triples or back off sets of five. And that's typically the way it's done in HLM. But yes, the problem with the three-day split or the three-day full body workout split is that eventually it's not going to be enough stress to drive an adaptation on the upper body lifts when you're only doing them 1.5 times a week, which is why we eventually go to the four-day split. And when I say eventually, I mean as soon as possible. <laughs> So yeah, I, I, listen, not often so eventually. I really like, yeah, so Kevin, just do the four-day split, bro. Yeah, you'll be fine. Uh, but I will, I tell you though, I do like the HLM, particularly for my old people, that maybe maybe my old guys and ladies can't press really worth a darn. Sure. So they're, they, don't, they don't suffer then from you know not being able to press often enough. Right? Sure. So sure. we can just toss that out and fill that all in with uh, with bench press. So not only is their squat HLM, but their bench press will be HLM that week. And so is their darn deadlift. And it works sure. really it works really nicely. And that's for somebody that's older and advanced. Sure. So they're squatting three times a week, they're benching three times a week, they're deadlifting three times a week, they're getting PRs once a week or maybe even every other. Seems to work nicely, but it's probably just not a fit for you. So quit scr- cramming that square peg in that round hole. There you go. 
Uh, Alexis sent us an email with a bunch of questions from Instagram. Okay. Here's one that says, thoughts on dynamic neuromuscular stabil- stabilization? No. I'm not answering N- that. Eh. Next question. Do you believe balance and stability are a byproduct of strength training? Yes, of course. See it every day, all the time, especially with every older person we train. Balance and stability are always a byproduct of strength training. Right? It's, it's <sighs> muscular control. You're learning how to control the musculature. Would you agree, Scott? Yes. You know, people... Uh, some folks seem to think that like balance is some mysterious skill um, that you practice and you get and you get better with it. And I'm sure that practice can improve it for skateboarders or walking high on line tightrope tight rope walkers That's or right. something like that. Um, but it's really it's you know it's about your it's about your inner ear and uh, it's about your depth perception and a few other things mostly. And when you see older people that are struggling with balance. It's probably not their inner ear. They're just not strong enough to keep their center of gravity over their midfoot in, yeah. in weird circumstances. So they, they slip on the bathroom floor, their center of gravity gets out over their toes or behind their heels, and they're going, they're going to fall down. Sure. It, the stronger somebody is, the more readily they can keep their center of gravity over their midfoot because the, the people's inner ears work. It sends the right data to the brain but the muscles can't execute the brain's instructions. Sure. Um, and then stability. The stronger you are, the more easily that you can hold weird positions. Yeah. Balance and stability aren't mysterious. I never fall. I was thinking about it. Like, I, you know, like my wife and kids roll down the stairs about twice a year <laughs> apiece. Right. <laughs> I've never rolled down the stairs. Listen, you need a game camera over there on the stairs. I know, right? It'd be funny. Uh yeah, you know, like I can remember biting it once or twice on like on real slick like black ice like when as you're getting into your car or yeah. out of your car, you know, which has nothing to do with balance. There's just literally no footing there. Or, you know, you're walking backwards looking at something and you and you, there's something behind you, you don't realize it and you trip and you kind of fall on your rump. But it's so rare. I, I just can't think of a time where I felt like I kind of lose my balance or even if I trip on something moving forward, you kind of catch yourself and it's, it's sort of strange. But yeah, yeah for older people, it's a big deal because... You break a hip or something that's that's bad news, hard to recover from. Yeah, I fell I fell the other day. But I had Did on, you really? Yeah, I had on a pair of boots and I had them laced up and I tied them off in a dog knot, you know. And I, I, I stepped over something and just hung one of the oh, loops on the on, on the of the shoelace on an implement. And it wasn't was. coming out. And it wasn't coming off. So that leg stopped moving and the other one was still yeah. going. And uh I took a little took a little That's spill. how you tear ACL, man. That's how you That's, get that foot that does that stops moving. It gets yanked and held by the, and the knee turns in and you go pow. Yeah, you break your, pop that ACL. I went down in a pile. It was uh, it was not good, but I got right back on up and uh, there you it's go. just fine. Uh, program here's one. These guys, these sentence fragments. You know exactly what you're talking about, but I don't. I want to help. Here's one. Programming for people with unpredictable schedules. <laughs> That's like right. a section heading in a book. I can't write the book for you right now. That's what Rachel, uh, my 15 year old's writing her first. Uh, there's a ring at my doorbell. And my dogs are going nuts. Uh, my Ka- Kaylin, my 15 year old's writing her first research paper. You know, I was trying to walk her through what her, we kind of did all the research. We got all the note cards. You probably remember doing that as a kid. You got all these note cards that you, you know, so you don't plagiarize and just trying to come up with a thesis statement. I'm like, all right, thesis statements. The main point of the paper, the point you're trying to get across. Like, what are you trying to prove with the research? And she said, sleep deprivation in teens. She's standing, right, <laughs> she's standing right outside my office looking at me now. I said, sleep deprivation in teens, what? That's a, that's a, that, there is no, there isn't a thesis there. Yeah, there we, is just, those are just words. Sleep deprivation in teens. We need a predicate. Is awesome. <laughs> is right. terrible. Why is it? Yeah. So, uh, but she got it. She figured it out, but it took a little while. I got this same statement in question form on Instagram Live last night. Uh, oh, nice. Uh, guys. Same person? I don't know. Okay. Uh, uh, Alexis didn't write who, who actually sent these in. Oh, okay. Um, people with irregular schedules typically have certain days of the week where they get more sleep than others. Uh, you need to train as heavy as you do your hardest workouts the day after you've gotten that good sleep. Um. You need to make sure that all the other aspects of your recovery are taken uh, taken care of, like diet 
and um, interpersonal relationships and all that stuff. So, you know, get your sleep, make sure you're, you're resting between your sets as best you can. And again, uh, you're going to schedule your more difficult sessions uh, to follow uh, the, the, your, the nights that you get the best sleep on. Uh, training before you go to work is typically best as well. It, but all of this stuff with you, people with these weird old, weirdo schedules is going to make you notionally a more advanced athlete than somebody who slept at night and worked in the day. And, um, yeah. you're, you're going to have to move to more complex programming than you would if you were working a regular 40 hour five by eight, you know, work week. So, sure. uh, well, there's nothing good to say about it and there are no shortcuts. Well, but you do what you can, right? Right. That's it. So, you know, there, there are lots of other stressful life events that are worse than working a weird schedule, right? Like parents die, you get a divorce, you're, even when you get a new baby at home and they're up all night long and you can't sleep. Like all those are worse. I'd rather work a weird shift. But uh, you just do what you can, you know? I have a I have a, a person, I, a lady I train right now, she's a firefighter, and she, uh, she only has access to barbells at the fire station right now because mm. the gym is closed. And so she trains two full days on like 48 hour, 72 hour shift. And then, and then has the next like four or five days off. And so we train her with the barbells on the days that she's at the fire station. And then yeah, she while does, she's at work, you know, while she's at work. Well, I know, I know most people can't do that, but it's still a weird, it's a weird schedule. Yeah. And, and then she has to do two kind of body weight kettlebell, things like that. Two days that she's at home. And the, the, the point there is, is that everybody right now, I don't know when this guy sent this, Said this question, but everybody right now in the middle of COVID and quarantine is training. Unless you have a badass home gym with barbells and everything you need, at which point you can just train a bunch because you actually even probably have more time on your hands. Most people are training under suboptimal conditions with suboptimal mm-hmm. equipment, and you just do the best you can to make progress. And yeah, how, how much of your life since you've done this, man, over the past six, seven years, however long it's been for me, the last 20. How much of your life would you say you're training under optimal conditions? Oh God, of, of the, of the 10%? last ten years? No, fuck no, not even that. <laughs> right, it's just so rare. Over the last ten years, last hundred and twenty months, eight months of it. Right, I, I, I mean that too. Sure, it's it's I, I I know you do. It's just part of the deal. It's just yeah. what are you gonna do? Something hurts. Something is injured. There's big life stress events. Oh, it's I, just the way I have, it is. I've had a. I'm doing, I'm doing, starting yesterday, I've been doing, I've been feeling pretty well, but uh-huh. the, the, the 15 days before that terrible stomach bug, cramping stomach, c- couldn't get away, couldn't get very far from the porcelain, like just terrible. Cramps are bad. I haven't Did trained. you get yourself a bidet? No, I haven't Scott, trained. I, I got to send you a bidet. Would you put on a bidet on your toilet if I sent you one? No. Are you serious? I don't have any problem with paper. I don't understand you guys. I think it, you think it's because you're just a you're literally a hard ass Oklahoma guy. I don't and you know. Just man. Have like I just, very, you think you got like calloused butthole? It just I've just never had a problem. I think I I think I wipe correctly. I think the rest of you guys are just like punishing yourselves. I, I don't have that big of a problem. Hmm. Interesting. I just don't. It's never been a hardship for me. I I I don't know. I don't think that my tissues are any more uh, hardy than anyone else's, although they may be. I, I just, uh, I just I haven't. That. It's just I never been a problem. A cover, I bet you're covered in calluses back there. I don't know. I bet you're like that lady that that's tanned seven days a week for the last forty <laughs> years. Right. You just got leather. You just like you. You got a yeah, leather. That sphincter. may be. That may be. Who knows? Does meal and protein timing impact training? Does meal timing impact does, training? Well, does meal and protein timing impact training? Yes. Of yes course. and no. Yes and no. Not the protein that much, right? Yeah, I think so. Where we're going? Yeah, I think you need your carbs, right? That's where you're getting at, right? Like you you got to have some carbs. fuel, right? So, yeah. it's, which is primarily going to be carbs for almost everybody. And I am not a fan of ch- even even somebody who does a diet like a carb backload where they eat quite a few carbs before they go to bed at night and then get up early in the morning and train on no carbs. And your your body, your liver, it eats most of that glycogen up and it doesn't it doesn't have an excess of glycogen to use for for fuel in this heavy glycolytic training that we do with like lots of squats and lots of deadlifts and so even for people who train first thing in the morning i really like them to even drink 
like a very fast digesting, like a glucose and water, dextrose and water combination. Chug a great Gatorade. Yeah, get, that's what Gatorade basically is. Yeah. It's half glucose and half table sugar, basically. Yeah, you, you need a little bit of that for the for the training. Now, if you're not if you're just screwing around, you're not training very hard, then probably not that big of a deal. Protein yeah. you really need after you train. More than not and not and not talking about well, and let me be clear, dude. I'm not talking about in the window. I'm not talking about you need protein in the five minutes that you're done training because you're in a anabolic window and you have to have protein. What I mean is that you have to have protein to build tissue. And so after you've broken down your tissue in training, there will be a process which doesn't occur in the first 15 minutes and only the first 15 minutes post-workout where you have to have your post-workout shake. But you do have to have protein to build the tissue after tearing up the tissue and to build new tissue. If you eat and protein so, with every meal, you're just going to be fine. You're just fine. That's exactly right. Protein probably, with every meal, you're just fine. There's probably somebody out there that's being a weirdo about all this, and I would say sure. that if somebody's an extraordinarily advanced bodybuilder or even powerlifting athlete, meal timing and protein intake timing might matter, but that is one-tenth of one percent, and I don't want to hear about that crap. Ah, uh, preferred training. Th- listen, guys, this is another one of these. Okay. Preferred training methods to improve the push press? Question. <laughs> this is like your thoughts. Thoughts? Well, we, question yeah. Mark? Is there a is there a deeper question there or no? That's all there is to that one. Oh, that's the whole thing. Yeah. Oh, because well, it's from Alexis originally. Yeah. Preferred I mean, training methods to improve the push press? Question. I mean, uh, so I guess the question is: is is there a purpose to train the push press? I'm certainly not going to completely knock it. I think there is a way to overload the press with a push press. I think it can tend to lead to bad habits with the the, the quad kick, the knee kick. Um, preferred methods to train the push press. I think I would just push press mostly. What would you do? Well, press and squat. Well, I, I, and I maybe know, power but, clean. And what power clean? Maybe power clean or something. Yeah, and push press. If if I mean, if yeah. there's a reason, if you're trying to hit a push press PR, I, I can imagine reasons why people would want to. If you're a competitive CrossFitter, you might want to push press. Sure, train that push press. If you're an Olympic lifter, you might want to push press. Well, let's make that. Let's make the question simple. If somebody emailed in and said um, programming to uh, improve the squat, what would you do? Well, we'd squat. We would squat. Yeah. So if I want to improve my push press, I would practice my push press. Now the the point is. Push press doesn't train all the muscles that we really want to train, right? It's really a push press is really a throw with the lower body and a lockout with the triceps. That's it. It's a little bit of elbow extension at the top. And so it's not, you're not going to get the shoulder work that you want. So I still need to be able to press like strict press and do that shoulder work. And I mean, you know, you might do some like pin presses, some high pin presses or press lockouts. What do we call those? I always get confused. What's the official word for that? Pin press, press or press lockout, either one, the standing presses with yeah. the bar in the rack. Both those were just fine, but ultimately a push press, I've done them before. It's been years since I did them, sure. but I, I've got up, I worked up to a 400 pound push press. You have 400 pound push press, you got, it's a lot of technique. The bar has to basically be sitting on your shoulders, which is not the way we teach the press, right? With straight wrists and elbows forward. Bar's got, because you need all of the throw from the quads to go into the barbell. The barbell is going to be sitting on the shoulders. So yeah, you just got to practice it and then get strong, get strong. And a push press is kind of like a snatch or a clean. Yeah. And, and maybe figure out why we're push pressing. It doesn't really make a great deal of sense to me. Just do your strict press. If you get that very, very strong, your push press is probably going to go up. If your deadlift, your squat go up, your push press is going to go up. And, uh, and if it hasn't gone up, it's just because you need to practice that timing where you convert the the, the leg action to the lockout with the hands or the arms. I, I don't know. That's a, that's not something I'm terribly interested in. Yeah. But, but I mean, it's, it's a fun, it's a fun lift. Strong man. It's a great lift for strong man. Sure. sure. Right. Because there's no rules on the overhead press. You can use your legs as much as you want. So yeah, that's so why my, I did it back in the day when I did it. It was because I was training strong man. So there's certainly reasons to do it. My answer is here in virtually every single word I've said on this podcast is all about training regular people to be rich, just stronger. Yes, that's you know? exactly right. So when I poop on one of these things, that's why, guys. And I know that there are people out there that aren't regular people <laughs> and are specialists and so on. And, and uh, hey, kudos. Awesome. But uh, that that's why I deuce on so much yeah, of well, this. Yeah, the problem is, is that you have enough people listening to the podcast now. How many people, what percentage of the people listening to this podcast actually need to push press? 
one percent, one out of a hundred, two percent, somewhere not there. Even. Not but even. No, certainly you know? not more, right? Certainly not more. And so, if you give the answer for the one that's a hundred, one in a hundred, or one in two hundred, or whatever, then it's it's probably not worth it. So we're we're trying to answer for the the masses to help, but certainly if you're doing push press, just push press. Yeah, that's you know, you and we're. We are public people, at least to some degree here. You know, if you're listening to us and you're not at my house, then that's clearly public sure. to some degree. And um, we're trying to educate people. And, and I have found, and I know, I know that you found this too, that if you actually address one of these thing, one of these things for more advanced athletes who are specializing in the Scottish Games or in strongman, sure. and you talk about the push press, we'll have 35 people who can't press 95 pounds strictly We'll start working on this advanced That's stuff right. for special That's sports, and exactly um, right. you know. So we're all. I'm. I'm. I always feel torn between staying on message for the regular person, sure, versus you know going off that script and in, in helping people who are more advanced athletes do their do their specialty sport. And I have no problem with that. But my allegiance has always been to the regular regular folk who are trying sure. to get a whole lot stronger. So uh, yep. Uh, and you know, all saying always is tough, but I think my allegiance is always going to be with those people. Sure. Well, unless you're having a one-on-one conversation with one of those. Yeah, that's, that's right. If there's nobody else around, you've got my undivided attention. We're going to talk about your thing. That's right. I still make all you stupid. Oof. This Michelada is burning. It's getting hotter. I'm halfway down. It is. It's burning. It's burning going in. It is going to burn coming out. But let me tell you what I'm excited about. I got a bidet to clean the burn, hmm. to cool, to cool the burn. I digest all my food. Listen, you drink a hot, spicy michelada. I've I've heard you. You and I have gone to the bathroom in truck stops before next to each other, been poop brothers. You do not sound like everything is okay in there. I'm fine. <laughs> it doesn't sound like you're fine. I, I, you know, I've eaten one of those Tijuana Mama, you know, pickled red hot tamales mm. or pickled red hot sausages, you know. Yeah, like one of those might tune me up, but it, it's it's tune it take, me up. Yeah, it takes something. <laughs> uh, it take it takes something uh, pretty nasty. So toe guy calls here or emails here. To- hold on, who toe guy? He's he's emailed before T O G A Y. He's from Turkey and he has uh, phonetically oh. written out his name for me because he's a good. Oh, man. okay, okay, toe guy. Um, he's based in the UK, but he says he's from Turkey and his name is pronounced toe guy. And um, in 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 uh, kilograms. He's squatting 180, uh, benching 200. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Deadlifting 200, uh, benching 105. And he's been training for about six years. And he said, I was wondering what you think about prioritization of upper body lifts. I have found that my squats affect my pressing work and vice versa. And that the deadlifts affect my chins, pull-ups, and rows and vice versa. Sure. I, 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 I buy yeah. that one. I wonder if I keep my deadlifts and squats at a volume, intensity, frequency of maintaining what my success would be with finally increasing your pressing ability. But uh, is he not on a four day split? <laughs> That's what, to me, you go to four day split. And if you're strong enough, you can add even an additional press or bench press movement on one of the lower body days. But that's that's how I get around that. I We've all been there. You squat, maybe you have some shoulder pain, maybe you have some elbow pain from the squats. And then you go try to press and bench press, and it sort of exacerbates that pain. Fair enough. And then, of course, like all the back work from deadlift can affect the rows and the chins and stuff because it's also back work. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's I think the right move there primarily is just going to a four-day split. And I like doing the upper body lift first on the four-day split. It doesn't really matter. Right, so I, I would go like Monday upper body, Tuesday lower body, Wednesday off, you know, Thursday upper body. And a lot of times I take Friday off and do Saturday as a lower body. And a lot of times I've set it up that way because Saturday tends to be the heaviest, most stressful day of the week for training. You get a little more time to train. It's not competing with work. It doesn't really matter. I'm probably nitpicking here, but if you're if you're decently strong and you're still in that three day split and you squat and then you have to press or you squat tough. and then you have to bench press. And then you have to deadlift. Uh, that's that's difficult to to deal with. So it's probably just time for a forty split. Yeah, it's probably you're right. He didn't say what his program was, and I didn't pick that chunk. But you're probably right. He says, um, "Wonder what you think about prioritization." Well, we always prioritize something every day, particularly on the four day split. So you do your heaviest thing first, whatever that's going to be. Um, so you know, if your squat follows your press one day in a four day split, 
Well, it should do that on a day when the press is the most important thing. And so if your squat is affected somehow because your knees are, or your, I'm sorry, your arm knees, your arm elbows, knees, elbows are throbbing or something like that, it's okay because uh, the squat's not the, not the star of that day. Uh, thanks for, I, th- I, I recognize that name, and uh, that's not the first time you've written in. Thanks for sending those, man. Chuck says, rectus femoris cramping. No doctor seems to know anything about what I'm talking about. My rectus femoris will lock up if I take a step while bent over. Why the? F- why are you walking bent over? <laughs> like, what kind of Jerry Lewis shit is that? When I pick my leg up, it will cramp with such force I can I, and I can't breathe from the pain. I know, I know, you don't take a step while being bent over. <laughs> That's what he says. But it's been affecting my squat. I've been working on form, 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 but after 270, this ailment reemerges three times over the last year. I'm 52 years old, 5 foot 10, 205. Been lifting since I was 17 years old. I've been doing your stuff for about a year. It doesn't bother the deadlift, and that's at 370 for five right now. Thanks for any help. I love the podcast and attitudes. He says, well, thank you. Cramps. Are you hydrated? Yeah, I mean, anybody, like, I just shouldn't, shouldn't get cramps. Are you hydrated? I went, uh, looked at some land yesterday, and I had to do about a mile and a half walk down a very steep hill. Mm-hmm. And by the end of that walk on gravel, my quads were cramping. They were shaking, you know, because I just kept every single step. It was like walking down, you know, 15 flights of stairs or something all at the same time. And it was a similar sort of, it was high volume and you're, you're like an eccentric, slow controlled loading and just just cramped my quads like crazy. And then it, when I went back up, it actually wasn't bad. It was interesting going up the hill, which was really steep. I mean, it got my sure. heart racing, but it didn't really bother my quads or my knees at all. So, yeah, I'm always interested when somebody's got this like in, typical, like insane cramping. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. So the interesting thing that he said about, if you think about the rectus femoris, I'm going to screw this up. I should probably look it up. I think the rectus femoris is the one that crosses the hip joint also Mm -hmm. uh, and the knee. So if you bend over and your knee is straight, so if your hips are in flexion and your knee is in extension and that rectus femoris is in its shortest position, uh, it would be anyway, but in its shortest position, and that very short muscular position causes that cramping. It's the same reason that people cramp on the hamstrings on a bench press because the the hips are extended and the knee is bent and the hamstrings are as short as they could possibly be. So um, why you wouldn't want to take steps while leaned over and in a super shortened position with the right to Morris is uh, beyond me. Uh, yeah, is he doing that thing where you walk behind the sofa and it looks like you're going down the stairs? <laughs> right. It's like, like what is that. going on, bro? Yeah. It's got to it's got to be I mean you might have some long some old timey in- injury there that that's getting you but if it's bilateral in particular man it's got to be either cramping or some sort of yeah like neural nerve or something <laughs> yeah agreed yeah, yeah make sure you're know. super wet man like l- literally drink a gallon of Gatorade a day for a week and if you still <laughs> literally and, and if, if your quad is okay, your pancreas won't be, so you'll be uh, a diabetic, you'll be but you'll... You'll be fine. Because <laughs> you, you do things and you, you lift weights. You'll be fine. Drink a, a gallon, gallon of that Gatorade. Gatorade. It's a lot of Gatorade. It is. But here's the thing. I've told you know I've told 300 people to drink a gallon of Gatorade a day. You know Nobody's what they Nobody's ever sniffed it. Right. They, they, they drink two quarts. Yeah, right. Maybe two quarts. You know. I like going to Sam's and getting a big thing of powder and making it like triple... No, no, you don't want to do that. You don't want, you no. know, there's like an osmotic balance that's just right. This, I know, this is I why you it. need if toilet you paper. It, what I'm trying to do, though, with the Gatorade is I'm trying to get back to the bidet as fast as possible. So right, if I clearly, if I overload the Gatorade, then it's just a quicker trip back to a sweet, clean butthole. Matt's like, I like triple Gatorade mix, a cup of Epsom salts, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. magnesium citrate all day long. I take shots of magnesium citrate with my whiskey. Chug that Gatorade. Make sure you're going to the bathroom you know, once an hour at least, everything's good and clear. You keep that up for a week and you're still having cramps. You might have a little pinched nerve or something. I don't know. I don't know either. Pretty uh, weird. I, it's a, it's a, it's unusual. And you know what? If you get a pinched nerve, don't go to the doctor. Who cares? Or just some like, sort of nerve. You know, do? like Sybil, Sybil's hamstring on her right side literally cramps every single time she bench presses and has for five years. But she's had hip replacement and knee replacement. I mean, you know, like, there's, some, there's some nerve damage in there. Gosh, I've so, had sciatic nerve pain for the last week, and I've never had that before. Yeah. It's not very fun. You can have it. I don't want it no more. 
Yeah, it sucks. I know. It's terrible. It's no I, I, I'm so detrained. It's so weak. It's so, so jacked up right now after having dinky fever or whatever the fuck it was and then that right. and everything. Dinky. Sick of it. Sick of it. John says, hey, you sexy beast. Greeting from behind enemy lines in New York. I've been enjoying the podcast from the beginning. Thanks. Thanks, John. <laughs> Thanks, John. He says, I've uh, really gotten stronger than I have ever been using your guidance. It really helped me kill time on your last appointment. Yeah, good. He says, any intention of doing a a little whiskey drinking and reviews to future podcasts? No, probably not. (laughs) It's Michelada's good, but he is burning. Yeah. Uh, He says, you have both suggested to do the pilgrimage to a coach, but it would seem that a seminar would provide an overview in in a concise amount of time. Coaching would be great. But I know it's just not something I could do consistently. Any input would be great. What should I do? So this guy, I actually emailed this gentleman back. And when I did that, it was in January. And I told him to go see Peter Nathan, uh, him being uh, in, in, in New York. And uh, Peter has left us. So I hope you were able to go see him. Um, I like a seminar environment. But I tell you what, man, a seminar takes a while. And I, I like it. I really do like it. But I think it's different. If you go and spend two hours with a coach with nobody else making noise and acting a fool and nothing else going on, you can really you can really improve your lifting a bunch in two hours with a coach. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe as much as you can in a weekend of seminar. A seminar is for a different thing. It's more educational. It's more about a deep dive into your hobby or your chosen uh, vocation, maybe. It's more sure. of an educational thing than a practical thing for lifting's sake. W- wouldn't you say? Would, do you yeah, agree with I think that? that's fair. I think that's fair. Yeah, and I think you know you're you're going to certainly pay more per hour for the in person coaching, but you get one on one attention. And so one of the nice things about a seminar is you you say, well, we can take twenty or twenty five people, and it only costs you five hundred bucks or six hundred bucks or nine hundred bucks or whatever, but you get to do it for whatever thirty six hours. Yeah, well, and you get to see hours. everybody else too, which right, is awesome. That's right. And so there's some there's definitely some advantages there to the seminar, but I I do agree for just straight up lifting moving forward from the time you get coached to the next you know the impact it has on your training for say the next couple of months that in person session for a couple hours is is tough to beat. Yeah, and getting a relationship with a professional yeah. is uh, is pretty valuable too. You know, um, I think most of the coaches that I know once they coach somebody in um, in person are uh, very likely to answer an email or a text message and uh, sure. help a guy out from time to time. So get yeah, I don't know that I've ever coach. received a, a text or a call or an email from somebody who's coming and see me from out of town that I wouldn't respond to. I mean, you, you almost feel one. Yeah, not that not that I feel a negative obligation, but you're like you've connected with this person. Hey, I worked on this person for a couple hours. They came and you know they drove four hours to see me in Springfield yeah. and they got coaching from me. And of course, I'm going to answer their question on on email. So he's in New York. So go you know go see Dan Flanick. Yeah, who is in uh, who's just outside of Syracuse as well in upstate New York. We've got uh, Stacy Rudnitsky who's in the city or close to the city. We've got so we've got people all over that area. There's lots of good coaches in the area. You should go. You should go see one. You'll find one. Yep. Jaden, how old do you think Jaden is? Uh, it's a 13 year old boy. Not 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 quite. There's no way that Jaden is older than 17. Jaden is 19 by his own admission. Okay, so that was close. He says, first off, big fan of the show. Thank you, Jaden. He says, I have a question about incorporating cardio into an HLM Texas Method variant. I'm fairly new to being an intermediate, and I'm currently running a basic Texas Method three-day program. I am, however, training to be a cop. This means I have to do some uh, some form of running alongside my strength training, even though I'd much like not to. He's uh, His one rep maxes are a 225 bench, a 365 squish, a 380 deadlift, and a, a 135 press double. He's 185 yep. and five foot nine. Okay. Well, I sure like all of that. That sounds really great. Yeah, it's not bad. I man, I get it. You gotta run. You, you know, yep. you're gonna go into an academy, you gotta you gotta beat the test, you gotta play the game. What I would do is I would run after your training sessions those three days a week. And I would yep. take your off days off. And so I would I would train probably preferably in the morning. I'd get up in the morning and I'd do my squats and my presses and my deadlifts and then and then I'd hit the pavement for a little bit and uh, and run and get done and then come back and have your shake and recover as best you can for the next 36 hours until you got to hit it again on Wednesday, two days later, whatever. Uh, first of all, I can't imagine wanting to be a cop, but if you do, 
And I, if, and if I did, and I were you, I'd go down the local police station and say, Hey, I want to be a cop. Is there any guys out here that train together? Yeah. And I'd go run with those guys. Yeah. That's a great idea. Or whatever the heck it is they do. Yeah. Cops, you know, cops have the camaraderie there. They, I mean, they should, they don't all, they don't all have this and, and fire, you know, fire teams are kind of the same way. Like some of those, the ones that do it well, they train together, they eat together. It's a, it's a team. It's like being on a baseball team or a basketball team and you're, you're on a team, you're just on a cop team. And so, yeah, and, it, you, and it certainly can't hurt you to get a job with them in the future if you've already been training with them for the past year and a half or whatever. Yeah, just go down to your local precinct. I don't even know. Sure. And just walk in there and ask them. And they'll, and they'll treat you bad. They'll be like, get out of here. You know, sure. That's all right. Figure out who they are. Figure out where they're training. Go. And if you can run, if you can outrun those guys, you're, you're going to be okay. Uh, yep. I, I had a, a young acquaintance, young friend who uh, just joined the Air Force. And, and, and he, he went down to the recruiter and signed his contract or whatever almost 10 months ago. And it took them until March 31st before they actually hauled him away to go to MEPS and BASIC and all that stuff. Yeah. And uh, he went to the recruiter's office and trained every day. Every, okay. Like five, I say every day, five days a week. Sure. Running, pull-ups, chin-ups, yeah. push-ups, all that crap that they do. And led PT down there. Yeah. Uh, a pretty is, good leg up. Yeah. Colin says. Colin, Colin asked me a lot of questions on Instagram. Seems to be an all right guy. Seems to be a good guy. Okay. Uh, he says, heavy breathing during the squat. After every rep on a heavy squat, I'm gasping for air. Sometimes I'm taking as many as 10 fast, shallow breaths. This is not going where I thought it was. Eventually, I've forced myself after two to three shallow breaths to take as big a breath as you can and squat again. By the time I'm done I, with my set of five, I'm lightheaded and cognitively slow for a few minutes. Um, after my first big breath, as I'm setting up in the rack, I feel I can't get as much air in after the first. Is this normal? Is my belt too tight? Does my diaphragm suck? <laughs> That is normal, man. That's normal. You ever done a heavy set of five, Scott, and felt good right afterwards? <laughs> no, or smart. <laughs> yeah, right. Or, wanted to answer some questions, play some Jeopardy. Yeah, man, everybody it drops everybody's IQ about 40 points for four minutes. That's the deal. Yeah, it's a squat retardation. <laughs> That's right. Um, but the, the, the cardiovascular thing, you ought to adapt to some over time. Like, it's not... That shouldn't... That should, you ought to catch up to that, don't you think? Well, yeah, but you got to get control of your brain and not let yourself hyperventilate. Mm. Um, you know, I think point. there's an adaptation thing, but there's kind of a panic response, and they can. That's right. <laughs> you know, let yourself take one breath out, one breath in, and go. Yeah. Just breathe out, breathe in. I'm real go. calm when I train. I don't know. I mean, you've trained with me before. Like occasionally, I'll get riled up for real heavy deadlift or something. But otherwise, I'm just like squat. I mean, every like even hard squats. I was squatting the other day, and I tried to get back to training again, feeling feeling good about it. But you know, I had a hard set of squats for five, which typically my that, hips hurt enough that I got to do a lot of triples and stuff. Five fives are not real common for me, but I still was like, I remember thinking to myself, it's just a, there's just a cadence, there's just a calm cadence to the whole thing. Now, when I racked the bar after number five. I was breathing like I was running from a terrorist for the last 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. But during the actual set, I was okay. You know, I just took another deep breath, down, up, breathe out, another deep breath. And I can feel my heart rate creeping up while I'm doing it. But it doesn't, like you said, there's no panic in it. I know yeah. that part of doing it right is staying calm. And then I rack it for the fifth rep and I step away and I'm lightheaded and everything. I can't see very well and everything's blurry and, and then I just really start breathing heavy. But it's all kind of normal. You know, we get criticism from dumb dumbs on the internet about not doing enough cardio training or whatever. And uh, I always say that those people just haven't squatted heavy yet or they'd know the difference or they'd know better. And uh, sure. Colin, Colin knows better. Colin knows better. We're doing a for real hit here. And uh, you're just going to have to manage the panic. Don't let yourself hyperventilate. Take a half, you know, do your rep, half breath out, full breath in, do That's another right. one. Half breath out and um, full breath in, do another one. That's right. That's it. Good. Any uh, more? Uh, yeah, more. we'll do. Yeah, we got, we got, we got a little, a little more here. John says, thanks for the podcast. It's my favorite and love how you do programming. He says, Scott mentioned while starting older trainees on a linear progression four-day split, he said, I've recently had to start 
restart training was wondering what a novice four day split might look like. We have sure answered this a bunch. Um, dude, it doesn't matter what it looks like. As long as the weight goes, we do put more weight, weight on the bar. It doesn't even matter. That's right. You know, if you want to squat, press, bench, press, deadlift, press, squat, deadlift, bench, press, hell, it, it, it literally makes, it doesn't matter. Yep. Uh, you, you might tweak it this way or that and make it three and a half percent better or whatever, but just don't overthink it. Train twice a week, or I'm sorry, four times a week and uh, do two of the lifts every time and you'll be just fine. You'll yep. be just fine. It's not, not a big deal. Oh my goodness. Andrew says, deloads? My question is, for a deload, do you occasionally switch to a nine-day week for a few weeks? This is something I just tried because I need to let the ga- let off of the gas physically. But more importantly, mentally, what's the longest week you've done or put someone on? I don't think in that ter- those terms, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, certainly it's one way to do it. It's just to, elong- to reduce. The, the goal of the deload you know, is to reduce the stress, right? You can reduce the stress by doing the same amount of work over more days, right? And instead of taking a seven day week, you take a nine day week or a 10 day week. That works just fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I tend to lean. It's just, I, I just like the weekly calendar schedule. I hate that it's seven days. I hate that a week, it's seven weird. days. It makes it's a pain in the butt. But, um, you know, what I typically do is I, I, I keep the weight close to the same. I might back the weight off the intensity off five or 10%. I back the volume off about 50%. So they still lift pretty heavy much less volume. They do it on the same schedule they normally would if they're lifting Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. That's what they're going to do on a deload, deload week. Nothing's going to be too hard. It's going to be pretty heavy, low volume, good recovery, in and out, ready to go that next Monday. Part of the problem with elongating the week and going to a nine-day week is now your schedule's jacked up for when yeah. you come off the deload. Now your week starts on a Thursday or something, you know, and you're like, uh, I don't know how this works. If you've let enough stress accumulate that you actually need need nine days, you're probably were in trouble. Um, most of m- not most my clients are going to be in a position after seven days of a, of deload, or really probably most of the time, even five days of deload, they're ready to roll again. Nine days is going to be either a sign of bad trouble or it's way overkill. And um, yeah, or but he, what he this guy may be saying, I don't know, is that he might be training exactly the same way. And just with the same weight and the same volume, the same tonnage and everything. It's true. But he's just pushing out over nine days. And so the only thing he's doing to fix the problem and reduce stress is to take the frequency down. Yeah. And if that's the case, see, we always need a little more specificity. I know a lot of our listeners are trying to go short on the emails, but sometimes we need to know a little bit more so we can actually answer their darn question the way that they need to be. If that's the case, Matt, you're probably right. That's probably what he meant. I've got lots of old people that run a four day split over 14 days. Yeah. So it just depends on who they are, but 14 you ask what's the longest for me, it's very old ladies and it's 14 days. That's right. There you have it. I want to do one more here. Eric says, let me start by saying, I love the show. Oh, subject was question for Scott. Excellent. There we go. I've recently right, enjoyed the, out. It, right, <laughs> the MED class, uh, et cetera. Um, He says, my question for Scott is this. Over the past several months, I've become aware of a philosophical system called propertarianism. Looking into it a little more based on what I've heard Scott talk about on the podcast, this system, which could even be the basis of a government, seems to be in line with Scott. Is this something that he has heard of? Uh, If he has heard of this, am I correct in my assessment that this would align with his core values? Properitarianism? Propertarianism. Propertarianism. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've looked at it for just a minute. I looked at it for just a minute, like years ago, and this this cat, um, this cat has come up with this entire Philosophy system of- system. He th- he thinks um, his name is Eric Danelaw. That's his name, and it's really based on just like a bunch of different co- a bunch of contracts between people, and they can just like govern themselves using a bunch of different contracts and stuff, and it's just. It's just a mess. Um, it's a autistic fever dream mess of just bullshit. It's just full of holes and assumptions. And, uh, you know, you can go look at it. The guy's got a website. It's propertarianism.com. You can go look at it, and, you know, you might spurg out on it for a while. It's just got pages and pages of all this detail about how he thinks that a properly run society should be governed by a bunch of contracts and so on. But he has, he has says nothing about, like, human nature, (laughs) 
<laughs> and, right. and then and how it's hard to get humans to first of all just even understand a contract and agree with what the contract says let alone abide by it yeah, carry it out right. right yeah we have we you know we try to govern by contract we have this thing we call the constitution right. and uh, people have replaced that with the with the bidet and uh, hold on it hasn't worked you'll never meet anybody that's more pro constitution than this guy and pro bidet we're not pro both. We're not governed by it, though. People have wiped no. with it. We're not. Do people want to be governed by the bidet? Uh, I would like to govern my they bidets. Fun, they, they, the Constitution and the bidet have served the same purpose of, of late, which is just to wipe with. <laughs> so bad. You, you know, like the English, the English have an unwritten Constitution. They talk about their Constitution, but it's unwritten. And we know about common law. Right, it's like like sure. all of the, all of their constitution is a series of maybe common law and some founding documents. There's a little like a tiny little bit of Magna Carta left, and and uh, there's some case law stuff, and and then also just just like practices and traditions, and it's all one big thing. And you know that's their constitution. And then we have a written constitution, but we're not governed by it. We we're actually we have an unwritten constitution too that we operate by, and it's like a amalgamation of like tort law and and, and uh, right. a bunch of court precedents and you know it's just it's just crazy uh, and nobody nobody really knows anymore what's legal and what's not yeah nobody really knows my mayor just told everybody that they couldn't uh, operate their property for uh, 6 weeks what yeah he's like you have a business fuck you go home oh well on what authority like, right. wh why did the federal government not go and depose that guy and l uh, restore everybody's property rights? Well, I don't know. I don't know what the rules are. Right. Uh, apparently, by the rules, your mayor and your governor can just, pre you know, prevent Su you from making a living. the federal government. <laughs> you know, they can just tell you, oh, you have a business and a fleet of trucks and you have other contracts you have to fulfill, but... Nah, you can't fulfill. I, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to torturously interfere with the contracts you have with your clients, not allow you to fulfill those. Fine, right. and nobody's going to go to jail over. It. There's going to be no consequences for any of these governors or mayors that have done it. Sure, and, and maybe there shouldn't be. But where's the laws? Like, what are right. the laws? I have no idea. Right. On what authority? Yeah, I have no idea. Interesting. So, so you would not call yourself a a proper tarianism? I am not. There you go. I am not. There you go. I'm probably a distributist. I don't know what that is either. <laughs> <laughs> you can go read you some like a Hilaire Bloke or a G.K. Chesterton. Oh, I like him. Yeah, they're like, uh, people, uh, society is best when we have lots of small holders. Like, right. g government should govern so that it encourages more people to own their own way of making a living. Right. Lots of small businesses. Lots yeah. of small property, lots of, uh, um, well, and a lot of a lot of using cash and just uh, giving giving people economic agency in the small in the smallest units possible, right? Like right down to the individual, and uh, right. uh, they probably wouldn't think a lot kind about uh, corporate personhood right. and a bunch of wackadoo shit like that, right? Yeah, interesting. That's me. That's me. Propertarianism is the wacky man. Sounds sounds wacky. Yeah. Well, uh, that's another Barbell I, Logic podcast. Yeah, right? that's a Barbell Logic podcast. So send your questions, people, to questions at barbell hyphen logic dot com, and we will answer those things on a future show. And uh, the shows are always Monday, Thursday, and then a little show on Sunday. So uh, uh, set your alarms and get up at four thirty a.m. Central Time when the shows drop. We'll talk to you all then. See you.